past several months teaching in different places. I've been giving talks on wealth, noble wealth. But when I start the talk, I simply say, I'd like to talk about wealth tonight, and nervous laughter goes around the room. That's the topic that seems to be on everyone's mind right now, is how their wealth is disappearing. But the purpose of giving the talk is to remind people they do have other forms of wealth that have nothing to do with the monetary economy. And it turns out these other forms are the most important ones. It's wealth that comes from the mind. There's a passage in the Dhammapada where the Buddha says, contentment is the foremost wealth, the highest wealth. Learning to have enough, have a sense of enough with what you've got, frees you in so many ways. You don't get into debt, and you learn to focus your energies on areas where the Buddha says you can't rest content until you've developed some good qualities in the mind. These qualities are also a form of wealth. When you think about wealth in the external sense, what do we like about it? Well, it gives us security and it gives us freedom. That's what we want from it. It's kind of paradoxical. We like being secure, but we also like being free. And it is possible to develop qualities in the mind that provide both the security and freedom. And that speaks to a deep, deep need in our nature. For what happiness means. They've done studies about different places that are pleasant to stay in. Part of the study had to do with figuring out well, where did human beings first develop. What kind of landscape do we feel most comfortable in? Whether it has anything to do with where we first developed, we do feel most comfortable, it turns out, living at the edge of a forest with a wide open view to a meadow. We like the sense of enclosure and safety that we get from the forest, but we don't want to be totally enclosed. We like to have some open spaces as well. That's a metaphor for the, what wealth does for us. It provides us some security, but it also gives us a home base from which we can move about. The greater our wealth, the greater our freedom, the more opportunities are open to us. And external wealth is good in the, only in the sense that it really can allow us to have opportunities to develop this internal wealth. And we only need that much external wealth. That's why we have that contemplation of the requisites, reflection on the requisites every evening to remind us of why it is we need food, clothing, shelter, and medicine, and exactly how much we actually need, realizing that beyond that is superfluous. And in many cases it's excess baggage It weighs us down. But when we have enough of that in terms of our outside needs, how we can start looking at our inside needs. There's a passage in the canon where Uga, who's a king's minister, comes to see the Buddha and he talks about a millionaire. Apparently it's Wisaka's father. His name is Megara Rohaneya. And he's saying, it's amazing how wealthy this man is, a hundred thousand pieces of gold, to say nothing of his silver. And the Buddha says, I don't deny that that's wealth, but that kind of wealth is subject to fire, floods. thieves, kings, and hateful heirs. There's another kind of wealth, though, which is not the wealth that comes from within the mind. He gives a list of seven qualities. The number seven is significant, because that was the number for treasure in the Buddhist time. There were seven kinds of jewels, apparently, which were considered the seven treasures. And there are seven forms of internal wealth. So this is the Buddha's 
investment strategy or investment program. As you practice, you are investing and developing these qualities. And as with any investment program, there has to be trust. That's why the first form of wealth is conviction, conviction in the Buddha's awakening. What that means is that it is possible through human efforts to come to an end of suffering. And the qualities that the Buddha used in order to do that, the qualities he developed, are things that are available to all of us. We have those qualities in potential form in our minds. Heedfulness, resolution, ardency. These are all qualities we can develop. And this is a form of wealth. And it helps us to explore the potentials of our actions. If we didn't believe that human action could do this, we'd probably limit our sights to what's being advertised in the newspapers, advertised on TV, advertised on the internet, trying to make ourselves happy with what the consumer industries provide for us. And that limits us, and it certainly doesn't make us secure. You buy something and it falls apart. You mass up your money, amass your money, and it just disappears. So if you have conviction that your actions matter and they will make a difference, okay, then you have lots of you've got lots of potential here. You're acting and intending all the time. So you have the opportunity to develop something skillful in your mind all the time. That's all to the good. You discover more potentials, more abilities within yourself than you thought you might have had. You've got this huge field that you can plant. So the next three of the qualities basically protect you against planting bad seed in the field. Virtue a sense of shame, a sense of compunction. Virtue is when you take your actions seriously and decide that you don't want to harm anybody. For example, with your speech, you're very careful to say only what's true, what's beneficial, and what's timely. And when you give more value to your words this way, other people will value them as well. If you treat your own words as being unimportant, words that just throw away, other people will treat them as throwaway words. So you've got to give value to your actions and make sure you're very careful not to cause harm. Shame and compunction help in this. Shame is the idea that you would be ashamed to do something that's harmful. Compunction is a sense of fear. You don't want to do anything that's harmful because you're afraid of the bad results that are going to come. Shame here is not the kind of unhealthy shame where you just think you're a bad person. Shame is when you realize that you have some self-esteem. You're above that kind of action. It's not worthy of you. That kind of shame goes together with a healthy pride, the taking pride in the fact that you're willing to learn from your mistakes, that you have the honesty to admit a mistake and to learn from it. And all these things together, virtue, compunction, and shame, are a form of wealth in that they protect you from having to look back on unskillful actions, the sense of remorse and regret that can come when you realize you've done something really, really harmful, really, really stupid. And those actions, once they've been done, those stupid actions, those harmful actions, can't be taken back. No matter how much money you could spend, you can't take back the things you've done. I heard a recording one time of a radio show where this guy called in. He'd been a soldier back in Vietnam. This is, what, 40 years ago? And the image of a little girl that he'd killed kept haunting him night after night. He could never really get any sleep. And, of course, no amount of money could get that image out of his mind. You could tell from his voice he was really tormented. That's an extreme example. but. We have lots of these things in our lives, the mistakes we made in the past. We look back at them, we don't like to think of them. It's like a scar, a wound in the mind. And so having a sense of 
shame and compunction about doing unskillful things. That's a huge protection, provides you a lot of security. They underlie the virtue of the precepts, where you make yourself a promise that there are these certain forms of unskillful behavior you're just not going to touch. That's wealth. Because when you're free from regret, again, it's freedom and security together. It's a genuine wealth inside. The remaining three treasures are more positive. Having listened to a lot of Dharma, that's a treasure. Generosity, discernment, these are the three positive treasures. Listening here means not only listening, but also if you hear something really good, you try to memorize it. And then you think about it, analyze it, try to come to an understanding of what it means and how it applies to your life. And this is a treasure in that you need a set of values to protect yourself from the ordinary, everyday values of everyday society. Rather really make it sound like your, your highest duty is to be a consumer. To keep the economy going. And your life should be devoted to producing and consuming material things. You need protection against that. This is what the Dharma provides. So that the melody is going through your head. And it commercial jingles. The words of the Dharma. To remind yourself of what's true, what's been true for well more than 2,500 years. These are true principles that hold across time. To remind you that you have a higher capability in life. That frees you from the, the traditions and values of ordinary everyday culture. Which think of a John Munn when he was criticized for going out in the forest, eating only one meal, eating out of the bowl. He was told, nobody else does this. Why are you doing this? Why aren't you following good Thai and Laotian customs? And he said, well, those are the customs of people with defilement. And he didn't mean just the, the culture of those two countries. It was every secular culture, every country, every country's culture is the culture of defilement. So he wanted to live by the customs of the Noble Ones, the values of the Noble Ones. So you have to be able to keep reminding yourself of what those values are, which is why it's good to have listened to a lot of Dharma. It protects you from doing unskillful things and provides you with the freedom of, a, of an enlarged sense of your own capabilities. Remember the year after John Fuhrung passed away, it was a very difficult year in the monastery. Things were pretty unsettled. And what kept me going was remembering things that John Fuhrung had said that suddenly became extremely applicable and things I could really hold on to in the face of conflict within the monastery. That was a form of wealth that he had left behind. Generosity is also a form of wealth. Giving away is a form of wealth. That's the paradox of generosity. It frees you in the sense that you're not tied down by your stinginess. It provides you with security. You know that there are people who love you, who respect you for being generous. And inside yourself you have a much more spacious mind. It's not so narrow and constantly worried about not having enough of this, not having enough of that. You learn to silence those voices and you say, look, I've got enough to share. The actual act of generosity, the first time you give a gift of your own free will, that's one of the first times in your life you realize that you have free will, you can make choices. Remember when I was a kid, I had an allowance, and one day I was in a supermarket and I saw an egg separator. I'd never seen anything like this in my life before. I remember as a smaller child watching my mother baking cakes. 
and having to separate eggs. And she just basically split the shell in half and would move the yolk back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, until she had got the white out. And I thought an egg separator would be really nice for her. So I used my allowance money to buy her an egg separator. As far as I can remember, that was the first totally voluntary gift I'd ever given. It's still, I still remember it more than any other gift I'd given, and also more than a lot of the gifts I've ever received. And I think it's because of that sense of freedom. You realize you have freedom to choose and to make a difference in someone else's life. So again, it's wealth in the sense it gives you both freedom and a sense of security. The same holds true with discernment, and this gives you even greater freedom. You learn to see for yourself many of the things that you'd originally take on conviction, that you have freedom of choice, that good qualities in the mind really matter, and that the suffering that weighs on you is not totally beyond your control. You have the choice to put an end to that kind of suffering, because it's a suffering that comes from your own actions. And it grows out of some very simple principles. One of which being, as the Buddha said, knowing what's your business and what's not your business is a sign of a wise person. When you realize that a lot of the stress and suffering in the world out there, the stress of things that change, and John Swat's image is of the, the weight of that mountain over there on the horizon. Is it heavy? Well, it's heavy only if you try to pick it up. In other words, events in and of themselves may seem stressful, but they're really going to weigh on your mind only if you pull them in. It's the pulling in that weighs down your mind. So even though there's change, those three perceptions that the Buddha has this development with regard to phenomena, and constantly stress, not self. The stress in there is the stress that you have no control over. But the stress in the Four Noble Truths is something you do have control over. You're the one who chooses to create it, and you can also choose not to. You can develop the path that puts an end to it. Develop the qualities in the mind that allow you to let that kind of craving and ignorance go. As the Buddha said, it's insight into arising and passing away, leading, leading to the right ending of stress. Looking at things as they happen in your mind. One of the keys to the Buddha's teachings on discernment wisdom is that you're not trying to look for realities behind what's immediately apparent. You want to look very carefully at what's immediately apparent. It's right there in front of your eyes. It's the wisdom of the little kid in the story about the emperor with no clothing. He was honest enough to see. He didn't care what people thought if you, were, you had to be a great, wise person to see the clothing. He looked and said, there's no clothing. It's that kind of insight, looking very carefully into what's arising and passing away in your mind. That enables you to see when stress comes and when it goes, and what comes along with it and what goes along with it, and what you can do to let go of the cause, to reach the point where the stress that arises and passes away in the mind doesn't have to come anymore. That's when the mind is totally secure. It's reached a security that's based on No conditions at all. It's totally unconditioned. And it's a freedom that's totally unconditioned as well. That's the ultimate wealth inside. So in the midst of all the ups and downs of outside wealth, it's good to remind ourselves that genuine wealth is a quality of the mind. It starts with contentment and moves on from there. So it's in the mind that it's that you find the best place to invest. The more time you invest in training the mind, the more energy you invest in training the mind, the greater the rewards. We're sometimes told that you should meditate without any gaining idea, but trying to get something out of the practice of spiritual materialism. Those teachings are good for people who want the results to come too fast. 
they want the results without having done the effort. They practice because they want praise. But over the long term, you do need to have a sense that the time you're investing in the practice is time well spent, and that it does definitely give rewards. That's what it's all about. If this path didn't lead to rewards, the Buddha wouldn't have bothered to teach it. But he did teach it, and it does give the promised results. Having conviction on that is the initial form of wealth for the mind. And this is the kind of wealth that the Buddha said, fire can't burn it, water can't wash it away. Thieves can't steal it, kings and hateful heirs can't make off with it. It's totally secure, totally free.